Uh, I'm Mohammed Mehdi. I'm a uh, principal DevOps at Verizon Connect, and this is our Papa Bear, uh, Keith Braddock. He's a project manager with our uh, Verizon Connect team. Uh, how many of you know what Verizon Connect does? <laughs> Except the Verizon Connect team. <laughs> really? But wait, yeah. there was someone who forget that who Verizon Connect does. Oh, I thought you just connected cell phones. <laughs> 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 All right, so Verizon Connect is a part of Verizon. Uh, a few years ago, Verizon bought a bunch of companies uh, and uh, clubbed them together. We basically are in the telematics space, fleet ma uh, including fleet uh, and uh, ELD and compliance. ELD is electronic logging devices uh, which uh, track how long a driver, a commercial vehicle driver is driving, how much the vehicle is idling, all kinds of it's uh, needed by the government. Uh, then asset tracking, fleet tracking, all kinds of uh, yummy stuff uh, with re respect to the fleets. Our biggest thing is that we developed a way for parents to track their children when driving. That's yeah. it. That's the biggest thing. That's, yeah, that's one of our products, product. yes. <laughs> yeah, next slide. All right, why are we here? Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, our journey with GitLab, how we started, what kind of challenges we faced, and what, how GitLab helped us resolve those challenges, uh, and what our goals were. And uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have some Q&A if you guys have any questions. Next, please. So initially, what were the challenges we faced? I mean, initially when we started this project, uh, almost two years ago, I would say, uh, we had uh, legacy systems, uh, Java-based uh, monolithic applications and those things. Uh, we had Git, uh, Bitbucket, Jenkins, and all kinds of stuff. We have Jira for uh, issue tracking and uh, the separate uh, ticketing system and everything. Uh, we wanted to convert everything to microservices. And we had a lot of issues in terms of how we were building our uh, data center. It took more than 30 days. We had a lot of disjointed processes. We had manual deploys. And it was not fun. I mean, it, we were spending too much of time on doing stuff manually and fixing errors manually. And that was uh, one of our biggest challenges. So we decided to move to microservices. And we decided to invent or write everything from scratch. Next slide, please. So what were the goals when we st uh, uh, started looking, uh, uh, the infrastructure goals when we started for this? Architecture. So we wanted to, at the end of the day, rebuild our data centers in less than 12 hours instead of 30 days. Uh, increase the development velocity, uh, cost consciousness. Uh, we did not want to get locked down into a particular vendor or uh, like a hardware vendor or a software vendor. It can be anything. So we went with uh, open source solutions. We went with open hardware, open uh, compute. Uh, and also we wanted to have uh, go with a solution which also provided, was open source, but at the same time had the capability of providing vendor support if needed. Uh, automation. Uh, we wanted to be 100% CI CD. Nothing should be done manually. Nothing should be deployed manually. Uh, uh, especially the server and network provisioning, that's where we started. Then eventually we uh, tried to deploy the applications and those things. Uh, integrated validations, uh, infrastructure as code, and everything should be repeatable and predictable so that we are not, uh, again, spending time doing manual stuff. Uh, extensibility, platform with swappable components. Uh, uh, for example, if we want to, uh, let's, we did uh, deploy everything in a, a private cloud, which we built using Docker. And we wanted, now we are uh, moving towards AWS. We build our, our goal was to build the solution in such a way that we don't have to rewrite the whole thing when we do that. And that's what's happened right now. We are moved, taking, we didn't have to do much work except for the AWS part where we did, uh, built, uh, built the uh, a newer infrastructure. Apart from that, everything else is just repeatable. Just go ahead and deploy it. Uh, avoid lock-in everywhere, hardware, software, and cloud. Uh, future proofing, flexible and extensible, easily scalable, uh, cloud ad adaptable, and platform agnostic. Uh, as I said, I mean, can we, uh, we can run it on a data center, we can run it on a private cloud, we can also run it on a public cloud like AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, you name it. Next slide, please. So, this is our uh, very high level diagram of how we uh, implemented our sites. We have two different sites uh, site A and site B, and these are mirror sites. Uh, we have production over there with mirrors, the production over here, we have non prod over there and non prod over here. And these are the different environments we had, uh, like dev, I test, safe, pre prod, 
Uh, some of the environments were needed because of the kind of uh, customers we had, uh, especially for them. Uh, but we had more than 360 physical servers and those things. But it was big. I mean, when, uh, right now, I mean, we are also adding AWS to this picture right now. So, and we are globally expanding. We have uh, stuff in Europe. We have stuff in China. We got uh, stuff in New Zealand, Australia, everywhere. Uh, this is a very high-level logical architecture. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had service-by-service -service failover without affecting other services. Service-by-service uh, -service isolation. We used uh, we, uh, used uh, VXLAN. We want to use MacVLAN. We are not there yet, but that's the goal we wanted to go with. Uh, we, use, we are using any cache loads, load balancing. So this is our side A and this is side B. If you look at it, they are just mirror images. There's nothing different. We have different services running over here, different uh, clusters. And this is our uh, infrastructure stack. Uh, we have uh, hardware, which is open compute, Dell-based open hardware, uh, Ubuntu, uh, Docker, Ceph, Anycast, Console, Kafka. It's a Spring-based Java applications and GitLab. And everything and every code we are writing uh, goes into Ansible. We, don't, we try to avoid using scripts, because with scripts, what happens is over a period of time, when you talk, think about operations, uh, somebody has their own favorite language. Next uh, thing you know, that guy left, and nobody knows that language. Now you have to maintain that scripts. So we decide we are not going to use scripts. That will be the last resort if we can't uh, do anything with Ansible. I mean, Ansible is so flexible if we really love it, and it's been really great. We didn't have to actually write any scripts until now. So what did we do? So we decided to go with uh, some of the automation goals. Uh, simplification, uh, fully automated, easily repeatable and predictable, zero touch and zero downtime deployments, uh, automatic tracking, standardization, Ansible first, a bash Python second, as I told you, I mean, we, ne we never had to use it, but just in case we had to, those are the only two languages we want to go with. Then same CI pipeline, every site. Uh, basically, uh, let me talk about the C same CI pipeline every site. Basically, we created only one single pipeline, and you can actually take that pipeline and implement it every in your sites which are coming in. You don't have to rewrite anything. That's how we modularize uh, and uh, customize the whole pipeline over here. And the last and not least, end-to-end uh, -end visibility, server and network configuration and provisioning, public and private cloud adaptable, automated maintenance and he healing. Next slide. Why did we select GitLab? Uh, as I told you, I mean, when we started, we were looking at certain things like open source solutions and uh, vendor support if needed. Uh, we already had Jenkins, and we used Jenkins in our legacy uh, environments and those things. There were lots of issues we had, uh, and but when we decided to look for it, we went with GitLab. One of the reasons is because it was free to use with an option for premium support. Uh, it has a very simple UI and easy to learn. Uh, it's not. Uh, difficult, as you have seen in the previous demo. It has some really great features, and it's very easy to pick up if you have some experience uh, doing CI uh, CD. Uh, some of the other features which we really loved, actually, uh, we didn't find with any other CI CD tool, is project management features, which this guy provides. It's basically GitLab replaced a bunch of disparate systems for us, like Jira, uh, Bitbucket, uh, uh, Jenkins, and um, anything. There's a lot of stuff which we uh, did not have to uh, have or use them again. So GitLab uh, provided us uh, with a one-stop solution for us. Uh, code review, CI, CD, issue tracking, source code management, audit management, deployment flexibility, and platform agnostic, and chat ops. Chat ops was also uh, one of the uh, important features we were looking for in, in this case. So how did we implement the, our automation plans? Everything is configured in Ansible. Uh, that's a single source of truth. Uh, GitLab uh, is used to create and track new features, manage projects using the project management features, implement repeatable and reusable modules, separation of changes uh, based off environments, uh, and one pipeline for all the environments. So this is our uh, very high-level uh, CI pipeline and deployment management uh, Git flow stuff. It's, uh, if you look at it, it's very complex. But it, with, at a high level, basically what uh, it does is, uh, if you follow the documentation of how GitLab flow works, we try to implement that over here. Uh, we try to go with uh, separate branches for separate environments. Uh, 
and deploy that based off uh, testing and everything as if one, let's say you're in, uh, introducing a new feature or fixing an issue or something like that, it goes into the first, uh, you create an issue, you create a, a branch based off that issue and go ahead and uh, commit your changes and everything, push it out, it gets tested and once it gets tested and everything, uh, everything looks good, you merge it into a, the, uh, let's say, I test branch. Then you, uh, everything's get tested, gets merged into the third branch which is your uh, pre prod branch, and eventually it goes into the master branch, which is a production branch, and gets deployed end to end. Next one. So, this is the high level flow which I just talked about. Uh, create an issue, create a branch, commit changes, and create merge request, approve it. Uh, we actually have a, a sandbox server where we actually don't uh, test the whole end to end pipeline, but we just the specific components which we want to test, which we, where we made the changes for. So we test it over there, triggers the pipeline, deploys component. It's if, it's, if it fails, we go back and it puts it back in the queue of the uh, developer engineer and says, you need to, these are the f issues, go ahead and fix it, please. If it passes, it goes to the next one, dev branch, kicks off the same thing, same thing follows over here into the ITS branch, and eventually it goes into the production branch. All right, so this is a sample CI file which you are using. Uh, as you have seen in the previous uh, demo, uh, we, we saw a sample CI file. This is one we are using. Uh, so we first uh, 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 create our variables. Uh, then we uh, define our host uh, based on different environments. So the good thing about this one is that we, if you look at, the, as we go down, I'll show you one more thing, is uh, this is, based on the environment. You, this is a global one which can be overwritten at the component level. That if you want to deploy a specific component at a specific environment or a site or something like that. Then these are before script, uh, then these are uh, different stages, these are just a sample stages. And this is uh, one of the job template which we are using uh, for Ansible. Uh, and if, if you look at it right, uh, if you keep going down, uh, this is, so in this one, this is the job, right? So this is where you can override uh, the sites, if you want to spec uh, specifically deploy any particular components or anything like that on a specific site, that's it. Then you can actually override it over here. So this actually, I mean, if you look at the whole CI file, it's actually modularized in such a way that you can take one component and deploy it anywhere else without changing anything. So that's how we decided to create this CI file. So we're going to talk about what I, I actually was a hard convert to um, GitLab. Um, part of it is I, I, I'm, I'm advanced in age, and so I was a um, um, I was a clear case, clear quest person in my earlier life, which I, I thought that was nice to hear. Uh, then I uh, became a Jira person um, because I believe that management needed to see a level of abstraction, but not all the details. And so it, it took some convincing from the, the young pups. Uh, but once I got into GitLab, I actually um, had to change my thinking. And that was a welcome exercise. Um, to actually have to go through that process and re-examine how we look at, how we track um, issues, how we track progress, and how we reported that um, was an extremely welcome exercise for me to go through. So one of the things that we did, and kind of at the time we started using this, there wasn't the, was it Platinum? Is that the highest version? Ultimate. Ultimate. I don't know why I want to say Platinum. I don't know, is it Platinum Gold? I don't know. So the Ultimate the, they, it was not yet um, in production. Um, so a lot of the project management features, enterprise management features, are actually in that version, and they and they they have actually incorporated a lot of the features that many of us that are in this world of managing programs and things of that nature were asking for. So it's a, I do highly recommend that anyone looks at look at that product. But I can show you how we were able to use the premium edition, right? Kaitin, we use premium, okay? Um, the premium edition to actually do a lot of what we were trying to do. So here's an example of a wiki. And one of the things I love about this tool is developers love it. And that's actually good. 
it's easier for them, especially those that are command line developers that want to do everything from the command line, um, the ease of commits and comments. And one of the things that wasn't talked about earlier was the ability to have open up a discussion at the, um, at the review point of before a commit's made. Um, those are really nice ideas, and we actually did a lot of doing that. But one of the things I love is that I can report out at an enterprise level to senior management where things are using their wiki page. And that was an actual welcome feature because I can include the actual item um, by tagging it in inside of uh, mixed with text so that then that particular, you can see this one's closed, but each item, it would actually give the stage and where it's at within the reference um, next to the, 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 the verbiage. So what we did was we used an interesting combination of milestones to track releases. So just to give you an idea, when we built, building our infrastructure, using infrastructure code, all of the code is actually in GitLab. All the pipelines are run out of GitLab. So we, we, had a, um, we were releasing um, basically updated um, scripts every, I think it was every month, I think we were looking at. Um, and so we ran it from a, as you can imagine, someone has to communicate to executives who don't want to know about Agile, who don't want to hear about the edicts of Agile. They just want to know when they're going to get their cookies. <laughs> Give them their cookies, their dessert. They just want to know and bank on it. So we use um, the milestones to track that, to give us an overlay, a view of that. Um, and then that allowed us to actually look at the boards um, and leverage the boards to actually give us the information that we need. One of the great things I did like about the labeling structure within GitLab, it allows you to do multiple labels to, to give you um, the opportunity to do to look at a project 360 degrees, to look at how, where we are at all aspects of it. And you'll see here when we look at the board. So right now the board is showing the development view. But let's say I want to know what are all the items that are currently in code review. I would go to that particular board and it would show me where they are and what status they're in. If I wanted to look at um, items that say, hey, I'm curious, what's the June release look like right now? I can go to that because we use effective labeling. I was able, we were able to tell where things are for the June release, what's in the backlog, where things are, have there anything's been closed at, at, for that release. Um, one of the things I love, there's the go live board, there's the planning board. So for me, who has to do all the planning and has to say what, what, what can we do, what is possible, this allowed me to look at what we're planning to do um, overall from a program perspective for the, the life of the actual program. Here you can see how we able to use labels and basically what we did was we said, okay, there are times when I, we're gonna need to know what was the affected system, right? Was it Ceph, was it DNS, was it um, Docker, Docker Swarm? What was the actual, was a hardware issue? So you can tell we not only use it to track how we, our projects, our code going throughout the project, but also we use it for support. So again, when we say this took over, every, we used it for everything, we literally used it from everything from soup to nuts. We managed our deliverables. We also managed our supports, our support issues. We were able to actually report out. And what I used it for from a reporting standpoint or kind of an overall enterprise um, monitoring is I was able to effectively use the labels using the labeling method that we use to say, hey, how, what are the things that are causing us the greatest issues? So when we look at budgeting planning for the following year, are there resources or are things that we need to re-examine based on what areas gave us the largest amount of tickets to solve for? And I was able to use this system to do that. The other good thing that a lot of people don't talk about is that at the time, Verizon now is moving completely over to GitLab, but at the time we had um, Jira and we had for enterprise reporting outside of our division, out of side of our group we were able to link this into JIRA and actually report out never having to leave the GitLab environment. So that was a great desire, need for us to be able to fit what corporate needed while still staying within our existing system, allowing our development teams to stay um, in the system they love. And that was a good feature. And you, again, you can see we went from area to, um, it, 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 it was interesting how we kind of mapped this out and a lot of this, you talked about the status, we talked about um, even we used, um, sometimes we use vendors to help us and we wanted to assign projects to know where they were. 
we actually used that as a label that allowed us to say, okay, how many items that are on our core deliverable are basically out with our vendors and where are they in their phase? So again, great flexibility. Um, it's the flexibility that frightened me in the beginning, but once I welcomed the change in my perspective, it's the flexibility that allowed me to do everything I needed to do and able to structure it in a way that I can report on it. And I think that's the biggest key. Being able to effectively use the boards to show me whatever view I need to see in order to maintain an eye on where things were throughout the particular project. Mm -hmm. Quick question, please. Mm -hmm. I notice your, uh, your tagging structure is really uh, involved. Mm -hmm. you have <laughs> multiple levels of tags, and there's, then there's colors that go with them, right? Mm -hmm. You have this list view where all the status slash whatever, they're all green, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Is that, that, that's a, so great question. So in the labeling function, um, I can go here. I can edit, and I can choose a color. Uh, you just, okay. I just choose a color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is there anything in the product that allows you to say get everything that's status related, or is that is this multi-level tagging mechanism pretty much manual? When, can you rephrase that question? What I'm saying is that if you want to report upwards on status, and, and I'm not being critical, I no, no. I'm mm -hmm. really impressed. I'm just saying if you're trying to report upwards on status in general, how do you do that? So you're talking about like an uh, overall status or if something was like, um, so outside of the board. So there's a, there's, a, there's a board, the development view that comes with the product that has out of the box status. Okay. I use that for normal status. What I did was also create, and what you can do is create multiple boards to give you different views of that normal status. So that I can segregate, segre segregate the data based on if I wanted to see where it was with a particular vendor that we were using, or if I wanted to, again, see uh, highly affected areas, I was able to be, or just wanted to see where we were as it relates to a release. But if you want to see status on everything that's in there, the, 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 the out-of-the-box development module just basically gives you status of things going through their particular workflow. But this allowed me to use theirs, but also create more complicated workflows based on what my needs were. Yeah, I, I have to say I think this is a, a rare, or just in my experience with the product, I, I think this is an advanced use case. Yeah, I was a nut. <laughs> I, I was a nut. It was me refusing to give up everything that I, that I needed for my safety net. Um, but um, actually it turned out, it, if you think it through, um, and I worked a lot with GitLab, um, and they work with us to really kind of walk, talk through the issues that we were experiencing, what we were trying to do, and they helped with my education as far as changing the way I looked at things. Um, we, we really wanted to um, absorb the way GitLab, the way they do things, the way they uh, do conversation development. Um, we were trying to implement a lot of that. So it, it, it was an educational transformation for myself, um, but it allowed me to um, figure out how to accomplish what I knew executives wanted to see while not disturbing the developer's workflow. And this, this tech, out of all the products I've ever used, and I've, I think I've used almost all of them that make sense to me, um, even Microsoft uh, products in some point in my life, unfortunately, um, this is the most flexible I've ever seen any product. Thank you, Kate. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, that was one of our main very, very critical uh, factors, I would say, going for GitLab. I mean, it, it really helped us out, uh, replacing multiple systems and not paying license fees and all kinds of stuff and maintenance issues and all, it, it removed a lot of headache for us. <coughs> now coming back, uh, impact of automation, uh, it reduced our complete data center deploy process to under almost eight hours. Yes, that's true. I mean, we almost uh, deploy our whole data center, rebuild our data centers every other month or something like that. Uh, just to test our pipelines and those things, and we do that within eight hours, and it's, it's really amazing. Uh, streamlined deploy and build processes, uh, enabled issue tracking and resolution, as Keith talked about, uh, enabled auditing and tracking of changes, when, who did the change, when did it happen, what was the end result of the change, did it get deployed properly, was it a, what happened when it got deployed, and all kinds of stuff you can easily track using GitLab over here. Uh, most 
uh, now uh, we started spending more time doing proactive work than reactive work in the sense like now we can think about how can we improve the availability of our application, how can we improve, how can we redesign some of the stuff which we want to redesign. So basically GitLab gave us a lot of uh, time back mm -hmm. in terms of how we are, uh, what, uh, what we're doing and wh where we are spending time on, I would say. Uh, obviously eliminated human errors, uh, specific role-based access controls. Uh, role-based access controls, that's the other really good feature about GitLab in the sense that you can give very specific roles to specific people to deploy on specific environments and those things. What can they do, what they can do. Uh, uh, GitLab has some really robust feature uh, built around it. Uh, and last but not the least, uh, increased frequency of releases and deploys. I want to talk about that a little bit about that last that last one because one of the things that I love about it from a program perspective, so you don't slow things down. We can have multiple people reviewing and approving during code review, but only a select number of people that actually have the authority to merge the master. So you won't slow yourselves down by giving a lot of people to do code review, but if you want to protect that master branch, you can actually within the tool restrict the ability of those people to do that. And that, that was sweet, especially when some people who are up late at night don't know what they're doing and they don't do CI <laughs> skip, and um, they actually commit a text file that actually kicks off a pipeline in the middle of somebody <laughs> trying to rebuild an environment. Yep. I won't tell you who that was. We've been there. We have done that. Everybody's <laughs> done that. Yep. <laughs> Points of a success. Uh, so we are almost at the end. Uh, Speed, we reduced, as I talked about, the speed at which we deployed our applications, our operating systems, our devices, our hardware, network gear, you name it, everything. Agility, agility, uh, we can use the same pipeline to deploy multiple components at different uh, platforms or different uh, OS or you name it. I mean, this l GitLab gives you the flexibility to do whatever you want to do. Uh, without redoing anything. Go back, go back, go back. Your slide. Time savings, uh, obviously, uh, end of the day, it saves you a lot of time and because not, you're now not doing work which you normally would be doing, like troubleshooting deploys, why it failed, what happened, and all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, release cycles, and lastly, auditing and reporting. Lessons learned. Uh, standardization, what did we do? Uh, Programming language, we made sure we uh, use single programming language, in this case I would say uh, Ansible, which is a single source of truth. We, don't, we, didn't, we asked everybody not to use anything else. Uh, adoption of open source, rule, open source roles and uh, software and hardware and everything so that we can swap components, we can deploy or we build our pipelines in such a way that we can deploy them to any open source solution which we want. Today we like Ubuntu, we are going to use Ubuntu to, uh, as our OS. Tomorrow we might go with Red Hat, who knows. I mean, we uh, created our pipelines in such a way that we can, we don't have to do much work to do, uh, redeploy Red Hat or CentOS or whatever we want to do. Uh, operationalize, uh, ensure our impotency. We created uh, roles for tools, alerts, and uh, dashboards and everything. Uh, we modularized the whole thing and uh, uh, created uh, repositories, separate repositories for separate uh, environments and uh, separate. We also wanted to do with separate uh, based off the kind of application we are doing, but I don't think we, we decided to stop it because we were getting too much uh, fragmented in those things, so we decided to stop it. Uh, next documentation, uh, we defined our change, uh, we documented our change processes. Uh, code is your document. We don't have a separate uh, website or a page or anything like that which talks about how things work. You just need to go into an Ansible repository and take a look at it. You will understand everything, how everything works. That's how we uh, wrote the whole uh, code and everything. Uh, last and, and again, project management. Uh, modularize, separate repositories by function, consolidated roles, logically segregate CI pipelines. 